on on Friday night at the Baptist Union Assembly gathering, there was a strong sense of us and them as we debated the proposed changes to the union constitution. Um, changes which I'm sorry to say were approved by the vote on the night, despite being so unbaptist. Um, I didn't speak in the debate, but I had worked with a group of others to help prepare statements that they delivered. There were nine people who spoke against the changes and only four who spoke in support of them. But the sense of us and them was such that one of those four called us a well-organised cohort of naysayers, which was fair enough because we were. <laughs> um, and it was nice of him to note that we were well-organised. <laughs> I try hard to resist getting hooked into us and them thinking, but I wasn't very successful on Friday night, to be honest. I noticed that the four speakers for the other side were all current or past pastors of large Bible Belt churches, two of them in the mega church range. And I found myself inwardly imputing motives to them based on the value systems of those kind of churches. There was a whole lot of our kind of churches and those kind of churches oppositional thinking going on in my head. And in a week where I'm preparing to preach on tonight's gospel reading, I was extra aware of what an unhealthy pattern of thinking I was spiraling into. Thank you, God, that I am not like those people. Didn't entirely stop me, but I did my best. Tonight's gospel reading is a good example of a story that is almost impossible for us to hear with anything like the force that it had for its first hearers. Many of the sayings and stories of Jesus recorded in the gospels have now been overlaid with later understandings, and we hear them filtered through another 2,000 years of accumulated meanings and perceptions. This story of the Pharisee and the tax collector praying in the temple is a classic case. You know those children's plays where you're supposed to cheer for the good guy and boo every time the villain comes onto stage? We hear this story a bit like that. We are now so used to thinking of the Pharisees as the evil opponents of Jesus that the minute we hear the word Pharisee, we're ready to go, boo, bad guy, no question. And when we hear tax collector, especially if it's Vincent, maybe, uh, we're prepared to be a bit sympathetic, you know, probably a downtrodden outcast in need of a fair go. The word Pharisee is even used outside the church now to describe those who are legalistic, self-righteous and wowserish often to describe people inside the church, actually. In Jesus's day, though, the Pharisees were certainly not seen as the bad guys by the average Israelite. Far from it. To many people, the Pharisees were quite heroic. They were the ones who had led the resistance to the watering down of the faith by Greek and Roman culture. They were the energetic defenders of the unique faith and culture of the people of God. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were seen as majorly compromised. They were the ones who had traded religious integrity for wealth and power. The Sadducees were in bed with Rome and doing very nicely out of it. And the ordinary people regarded them as corrupt fat cats and had very little admiration for them. But the Pharisees were never accused of religious laxness or compromise. They were the heroes of the true faith in those days. Even the conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus is probably quite exaggerated in our minds. Those of you who have devout Jewish friends will know that most of them love nothing more than a good argument over matters of religion. And the willingness to engage you in such an argument is a mark of respect. There was a great deal of argument and a great deal of respect between Jesus and the Pharisees. 
Jesus actually had more in common with the Pharisee party than with any of the other known parties in first century Judaism. So the difficulty for us now is that when we hear this story through our long accustomed dislike of Pharisees and sympathies for tax collectors, there's nothing in it that shocks us or unsettles us. We hear the punchline, the tax collector went down to his home justified rather than the Pharisee, and we think, and that's just as it should be too. Let me give you a tip. Anytime you hear a parable of Jesus and think, yeah, that's just as it should be too, you probably haven't heard it right. You've probably missed the point. We hear the Pharisees' prayer with disgust. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. What an arrogant prick we think. We Australians are especially allergic to that kind of self-aggrandizement. We find it hard to imagine that such a prayer out loud in public could be anything but obnoxious. But actually, it was far from unusual in that world. Rather than being seen as especially arrogant, it was more or less one of the prescribed prayers that he was required to pray on entering the temple or the synagogue. There's a few versions of it, but one version we have recorded um, in the Jewish Talmud goes like this. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, that you have set my portion with those who sit in the house of study, and you have not set my portion with those who sit in street corners. For I rise early and they rise early, but I rise for the words of Torah and they rise for frivolous talk. I labor and they labor, but I labor and receive a reward and they labor and do not receive a reward. I run and they run, but I run to the life of the future world and they run to the pit of destruction. Those who heard Jesus tell this story would have been very familiar with such prayers and would not have regarded them as arrogant at all. The Pharisee would be seen as giving appropriate thanks to God for the blessings of being able to enter the house of God and study the word of God. The suggestion that a sinner who collaborated with the Romans would be favoured more highly by God than this truly devout hero of the faith would have shocked Jesus' hearers almost beyond belief. So if we try and factor the shock back into it, what are we supposed to make of it? What is Jesus wanting to say to us? Let me suggest that it might not be quite as straightforward as a simple contrast between pride and humility. The Pharisee is very pleased with his own religious success, and the tax collector sounds full of remorse. But that's not all that is apparent here. And I think there's something else that's a very important part of the picture. There's a dynamic that has to do with the way they do or don't regard each other, a dynamic that I fell into on Friday night. The Pharisee looks around and finds a person who embodies everything that he wants to differentiate himself from. Thank you, God, that I am not like that scumbag over there. I do what's right. He does evil. Now, it's quite likely and even probable that what the Pharisee is saying and thinking is pretty much true. But a factual truth and an emotional and spiritual failure can go hand in hand. He has used his religious framework to divide the world up into simple categories of good and bad. And he's located the bad entirely in other people. He's by no means on his own. This is almost completely normal. And that's integral to Jesus's point. More often than not, we identify the evils with which we struggle 
in other people and then attack them there. It is those people who are the cause of all our problems. If we could just get rid of them, then we'd all be so much more able to get on with serving God properly. And of course, if we respond to this story by secretly praying, thank you, God, that I'm not like that Pharisee, then we have undoubtedly fallen into the exact same error. And yet it is subtle, isn't it? Because Jesus is himself is clearly saying that the Pharisee is wrong. So this is not as simple as saying that you can't make a judgment or name a wrong. It's not an absolute catch-22. The trouble is when we only identify evil in other people, we become part of the problem, not part of the solution. We drive a wedge between ourselves and them. If I had got to my feet on Friday night and given voice to what was going on in my head, that's exactly what would have been happening. Divisions would have deepened. When we identify sin only in others, we're very unlikely to succeed in getting them to face up to the sins we've named. Usually, it just gets them to retaliate instead and to point out our sins and our hypocrisy. In the end, nobody is identifying any problem behavior that they can do anything about. We're all identifying other people's issues, and no one is identifying and tackling their own. We're all adding to the sum total of anger and hostility and divisiveness in the world, and nobody is owning anything or doing anything about their own contributions to it. As St. Augustine said when preaching on this story, we end up like people who go to a doctor and are so busy crowing about how much sicker everyone else in the waiting room is than us that we forget to describe our own symptoms and we leave the doctors without a cure. Probably the most admirable thing about the tax collector in this story is that he doesn't buy into this tit-for-tat game. No doubt he hears the put down of the all in the all too public prayer of the Pharisee, but he doesn't retaliate. Rather than angrily point out the speck in the Pharisee's eye, he humbly attends to the log in his own. God be merciful to me, a sinner. He's commended, I guess, I suggest not only for his humble facing up to his own sin, but for his resisting of the temptation to retaliate to the provocative one-upmanship of the Pharisee. Like Jesus himself, he absorbs the insult and doesn't return it. And so he contributes to draining the swamp of hatred and divisiveness. Jesus invites us all into a journey of transformation. And a major part of that journey is facing up to the ways that we contribute in our own little ways to the sum total of hatred and hostility and divisiveness in the world. Unless we can get to the point of acknowledging that our contribution to the problem, even if not as big as someone else's, is just as important as anybody's. And it's the only bit that we are entirely responsible for doing anything about. Unless we can do that, we can't even begin and we will remain part of the problem. I didn't jump to my feet on Friday night, but I need to recognize that just under the surface, there was a whole cesspool of arrogant and divisive thoughts that I still need to address. That's the one part of the overall problem that I am definitely in a position to do something about. And you can do something about your part. That's why here in our worship, even though it's much more fashionable these days to see ourselves as just victims of a bad environment or something, we still offer up prayers that confess that we are entangled in sin and that we need forgiveness and reconciliation. The danger, of course, is that we 
pray those prayers while thinking of people other than ourselves who seem to fit each of those categories instead of examining ourselves to see honestly where they are addressing us. But if we pray them with our focus in the right place, we will recognize them as an important challenge to us ourselves and as a call to number ourselves among those in need of healing and forgiveness and transformation. It's then there in that place, on our knees in sorrow over our enmeshment in the hostile divisive patterns of us against them thinking and us against them behavior, that we will find Jesus at our sides with an arm around our shoulders and the words of forgiveness on his lips. And as we choose his path of forgiveness, rather than our old paths of accusation and resentment and contempt. It's then that we will hear him say to us, arise and be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. You may go on your way, put right with God. <laughs>